Hi there, marketing research students and SPSS users. In this video, we're going to briefly talk about correlations. Specifically, we're going to do a quick refresher on what a Pearson correlation is, how we can visualize a Pearson correlation, how we can calculate a Pearson correlation, and then finally, we'll see how SPSS is a useful tool for us to generate a bunch of correlations quickly and easily, and then we will think about how to format those correlations so that they're ready for publication. First, what is a correlation? In this case, the correlation is the strength of a linear relationship between two continuous variables. By a continuous variable, I mean a variable that's either interval or ratio. For those of you who are familiar with correlation coefficients, you might remember that correlation coefficients can range from negative 1 to positive 1. A correlation of negative 1 means a perfect negative linear relationship. Positive 1 means a, positive, a perfectly positive linear relationship. And a correlation of 0 would mean that there is no linear relationship between the two variables. Now, if you forgot exactly what a correlation coefficient is, maybe one of the more fun ways to remind yourself is to go to a website called guessthecorrelation.com. I'll make a new game here. You'll see that I've played quite a few times. And it's going to show us a scatter plot of data. So one variable on the x-axis, one variable on the y-axis. They're both clearly continuous, interval or ratio. And my job is to guess the strength of the correlation coefficient so we remember a correlation coefficient can range from negative 1 to positive 1, positive 1 being perfect positive linear relationship. Now this doesn't look like to have much of a relationship at all, so I'm going to guess something close to 0. I'll guess maybe 0.15 and see how I do. Ah, the correlation was 0.19. I guessed 0.15. I was only off by a little bit. Did a good job. Let's try again. Ooh, again, not much of a correlation, so I'll just guess 0.2. Good job, me. Hmm, maybe point 0.3 here. More of a correlation than I guessed. Darn it. Try again. Ooh, that looks like a bit more of a positive correlation. Check point 0.5. Good job. Finally, ooh, that's a strong correlation. I'll guess point 0.9 on that. Right on the money. So as you can see, these values uh, that we've been guessing here give us a sense of the strength of the linear relationship between two variables. Of course, Guessing is, is fine for a little game here, but we'd really like to calculate exactly what these values are ahead of time, and we can do that easily using Excel or SPSS. For example, let's take a look in Excel at uh, some data that's based on the same type of data you see in our SPSS data set about the craft beer survey. So here we have just a small sample of just 20 people this is the number of questions they got correct on the beer test, which can range from zero to four questions right. And here's the price premium that someone said they were willing to pay for a six pack of stone beer instead of a six pack of Bud Light. So this individual here said they were willing to pay $4 more for stone six pack than a Bud Light six pack. The question is, is there a linear relationship between these two variables? Before we calculate a correlation coefficient, we could simply visualize it with a scatter plot. And sure enough, we see on the x-axis here, we have people that got zero questions right, one question right, two questions right, three questions right, four questions right. And there does appear to be some sort of positive linear relationship here. You could even go a little further. You right click on these, on the dots. Excel lets you easily add a trend line. And we can see this is the best fit linear line right here. And if we ask to display the R squared value, we see that we have an R squared. Let me make it a little larger here so we can see it easily. We have an R squared of 0.3. Four, eight, which indicates that there is a uh, strong linear relationship. And we'll keep this number in mind. We'll refer to it later once we actually calculate the, Pier the Pearson correlation. 
coefficient. We'll see its relationship with this value. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually compute the Pearson correlation for these two variables by solving the equation ourselves. It's quite easy in Excel. It's a little tedious. Uh, here's the equation for the Pearson correlation. We're solving for this little r here. And then it looks like we have this big, giant equation of a whole bunch of nasty stuff that we need. But in reality, if we look a little closer, we'll realize it's not so bad. Notice here that I've called our score on the beer quiz x for now. We have a bunch of x's in here that we're going to need to solve for. And then our price premium here we have is y. It doesn't matter which one I call them. We'll get the same answer, but this makes it convenient. And then let's look a little closer in here. xi here stands for each, for each one of the x variables. i is the index there. x bar, that's the average of all the x values. Yi is for each of the y values. And y bar is the average value for price premium. So clearly, we already have each xi and yi values here. We need the averages. So I already computed those. I'll unhide those spots. You'll see here where this equation come from. It's a simple average equation. So I just equals average for all the x values. The average of all the x values gives us x bar. I did the exact same thing for the y's. So we now have our x bar and y bar right here and here. We have our x i's and y i values. So now we can proceed to expand upon these equations. It looks like first I need to take for each x value, I need to subtract out its average. And for each y value, I need to subtract out its average. Well, that's easy enough. I can do that as well. Let's see. I have it right here. See, I made a new column called x i minus the x of the average. And for each cell, Notice, it's, here's for this value of 2, it said subtract out the average, so minus h23, there's the average. You might remember in, you use these money signs to lock the cell reference. So for example, here, when I dragged all these down to make the equations, if I go to the last one, you'll see that it's referencing this value of x, but it's still locked and holding h23 in place like it should have been. Very nice. So cool. So I now have all of my uh, xi minus the x average values. I do the exact same thing for the y's. So again, here's a value of y. Subtract out the average. And I do that for each and every one that I drag all the way down. Again, using the money signs to lock out. Make sure that that average value stays in place. Cool. OK, so I've solved this thing here. And I solved this thing here. It looks like now that I have these values, I'm supposed to multiply them together. And then there's a sums here. So after I multiply each one, get the value, I need to sum them all up across all 20 occurrences. OK, I can do that. Let's unhide this. Here we go. This is me 20 times doing the, this step right here. Let's see. Let's look. Yep, this is the x, the xi minus the mean of x times the y minus the mean of y. <clears throat> and then, of course, I just repeat that step all the way down. Notice how this one's doing it here for the last one. Cool, so I did that 20 times. And then it says, OK, you got to sum that all up. Cool, I can do that right here. So I'm going to call this just the sum of the column. Boom. I just use the sum function to sum up all these values, just like it asked. Cool. So I did this top step here. So I got the first part here all in the numerator. Now I need to get the stuff down here in the uh, denominator. OK, so this time it wants me to take xi minus its mean, which I already have here. I did that part. But OK, I need to square it this time. All right, so I have a column here where I did that. So boom, I already I just simply referenced the original x value minus the x average. But now I'm squaring it as well. So you can see I squared this. I did that all 20 times. So x minus the mean squared. So I had to do that 20 times. And after I did that, it said sum them all up. OK, cool. I summed them all up. But then I wasn't quite done yet. Because after I summed them all up, then I need to take the square root. So I said, OK, sum the square root. Cool. I can do that. I have my little cell right here. And you look, I did both those functions at once. 
look at the inner parentheses here. I did the sum. I summed them all up, just like the equation said. And then I ended with a square root. So I, it's SQRT. So I have a double function. I have the second function here nested within. And there's my sum and square root. So, okay, I got that piece. Then I just need one more little piece here. This time do the exact same thing, the sum, and then take the square root of uh, the squared uh, yi minus mean of y values. So again, do that step, do, 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 do. And sum the square root of all this. So again, I sum it, take the square root of it. I got my three pieces. So I got piece one, the numerator. I got the two pieces in the denominator, but I do need to multiply them together. Let's see, that'll solve for r. Well, let's, I can probably do that. So I'll call this r equals. All right, so let's see, r equals. So first I got my numerator thing up in the column. I got my value right here, very nice. And then it says divide by, and then I'll use parentheses. That makes me happy to keep things nicely organized. So it says, all right, take this thing down here in the denominator, the x's. I already did that. I got the sum and then square rooted it. And then multiply that, right? I got to multiply that thing together and sum the square root of the y's. So we did that here. If we do that, I get an r value. Ooh, that's a lot. I don't probably need to see all those values of about, after accounting for rounding, about 0 0.590. Very good. And then let's take a look at <clears throat> what happens if I took r squared. So it seems like I'm just going to square this value here. And we get, whoa, I don't need to see all those values. And we get 0.348, which you right, might remember is the same exact r squared value that we saw when we scatter plotted this data and we had Excel compute the r squared of the best fit linear line in the scatter plot tool. So great. This is how we can do this by hand, a pair of variables at a time in Excel. From here on out, though, now that we understand how the correlation coefficient looks, how it's calculated, how to interpret it, let's proceed with using SPSS to make a large set of different correlations for us quickly and easily. Generating correlation coefficients is rather easy in SPSS. We can do that by simply going to Analyze, Correlate, and since we're looking for the relationship between two variables, we'll just do bivariate correlations. Here, we can select from any of the variables that we have in our data set, and using our Spring 2014 Craft Beer practice data set, uh, I'm going to select, I'm going to right click here and display the variable names. We're going to use the lifestyle variable, so whether or not sees, someone sees themselves as a craft beer enthusiast, which is a Likert scale question that we're conceptualizing as interval scaled. We'll do quiz correct recode. This is the number of questions they got right on the beer test, ranging from 0 to 4, so that's ratio level data. And then we'll also use the BRPRIC stone price premium. This variable tells us how many more dollars someone was willing to pay for a six pack of stone beer than a six pack of Bud Light. So that's also ratio level data. Then hmm, maybe we'll take a correlation with gender. No, we shouldn't do that. Gender is a nominal level variable. And to, collect, to compute Pearson correlations correctly, all of our variables should be at least interval level. So we'll just take a correlation of these three. If you look here for our correlation coefficients, there's actually more than one type of correlation out there, but we're going to focus on the Pearson for now. The others have their excellent uses as well, but we'll just keep it with sort of the default, which is the Pearson. For the test of statistical significance, we'll do a two-tailed test, testing for either positive or negative correlation either direction, and we'll tell flag significant correlations for our options. We'll also ask for means and standard deviations. This is just summary statistics that we're asking for as well. We've set this all up. So we could hit paste to save our syntax, or we can just hit OK to run it. Oops, there we go. Here is the code that we generated starting with correlations all the way down. And now we get our output. <clears throat> 
you'll see here we have our three questions. We have our various mean scores that we asked for when we checked that option, standard deviations. You notice we have different sample sizes here. So it looks like not as many people answered the craft beer enthusiast question, and a lot of people took the uh, beer quiz, 178 of the 200. Here's our correlation matrix. So the correlation matrix, what it does is it shows us all of the different correlation coefficients for all the different potential combinations. So the first thing you should notice is that each of the three variables is both in the rows and in the columns. So what that means is, first, uh, first of all, if we want to see the correlation between the first variable, so the lifestyle variable, I consider myself a craft beer enthusiast, you could start here, the first column, and you want to look at the correlation with the craft beer quiz, you could go down here to quiz correct recode, so that's 1 and 2, and you'll see a correlation coefficient of 0.582. Similarly, if you go from the start at the first row and go to the second column, since it's the same variables, you'll see the exact same correlation value. So that teaches us something quickly. All we need to really look at is the lower diagonal here. The upper diagonal is just a mirror image of all the same correlation coefficients, so we'll probably want to clean that up in a moment. Now another thing you might be wondering is how come there's a correlation of 1 being reported down the diagonal. What's going on here is, well, that's simply saying a variable, so a craft beer enthusiast variable, is perfectly correlated with itself, which makes sense. It's maybe a fancy way of saying x equals x. Now, looking at all our different correlation coefficients, we can see that the strongest cor positive correlation was here between someone being a craft beer enthusiast and knowing a lot on the beer quiz. That makes sense. It's statistically significant. This is a p-value right here, and if we were testing this at 95% uh, percent confidence, uh, we would be able to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, the null hypothesis is that there's no correlation, and no correlation would be zero. So we reject that null and say that, yes, there is a statistically significant linear relationship between these two variables. Similarly, we also see that if someone considers themselves a craft beer enthusiast, there's also a positive relationship with how much they're willing to pay for a six-pack of stone compared to a six-pack of Bud Light. It's a positive relationship. And again, there's double stars here, meaning it's significant at the O1 level, which means it's also significant at the O5 level. And we can see that significant value right here as well. However, there was not a statistically significant difference, uh, sorry, a, a statistically significant relationship between the number of correct answers on the beer quiz and the premium that they were willing to pay for stone over Bud Light. We have a correlation coefficient of 0.139, and our p-value here is 0 0.074. That is greater than our critical value of 0 0.05, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. While we see a value here that's different from zero, we are not willing to claim that it's actually different from zero. Finally, you might notice that the n, that's our sample size, is different for some of these different comparisons. We have 158, I'm sorry, we have 146 for the first and second variable. We have 100 and uh, 145 for the first and third variable, and we have 167 for the second and third variable. The reason the sample sizes are different is we can only calculate a computer correlation coefficient if there's valid values for both of the two variables. So if we had missing data on one variable, not the other, or missing values on both, we couldn't include them. So there was different patterns of missingness in our data, so we have different size of uh, sample. Okay, Now that we have our correlation matrix, let's clean it up a little bit and prep it for our publication. Okay, now that we have our correlation matrix, and we also have our summary statistics of the mean and standard deviation, I think it's time for us to actually prepare this for publication. So there's more than one right way to do this, but the reality is we want to clean this up in a way that it emphasizes the most important insights uh, and minimizes things that maybe are less important to our reader. So we could do this entirely within SPSS, or alternatively, and as I'm going to show you here, we're going to do a little bit of work in SPSS and then migrate the final steps over into Excel, which uh, for many students is a little easier to navigate. So first for our correlation matrix here, the most important part is the correlation coefficients. Uh, so I'm going to double click to my correlations. Now you might have a separate menu that popped up when it did this, but what should change here is there should be a menu up top that says pivot, and we'll select pivoting trays. And what we can do here is we can grab the statistics set of values and slap that into our layer. Close this. 
And now <clears throat> we can toggle between significant values, Pearson correlations, and the n. And clearly the most important here thing here is actually the Pearson correlations. Because we add the stars showing, we actually know without showing the p-values, we actually know which ones are significant or not because we have the little asterisks helping us. So this is all we need to see. Now in addition, we realized that the upper and lower diagonal were, were the exact same values. So we can actually delete those upper values. No reason to be redundant with our information. We will not worry about that right now. Now also these variable labels are rather long, so we're gonna clean them up a little bit here. I'm gonna double click into lifestyle. I think, let's call it enthusiast. And we'll identify it with a one as our first variable. I'll identify this one with a two, call it quiz. Score on beer quiz. And then finally, for our final variable, I'll call it three. And I'll make premium price premium willing to pay for six pack of stone. Okay. And now that I've identified these as one, two, and three, I can just identify them by their codes up here, which really shortens up this giant wall of text. That's much nicer. We'll probably want to stretch this in a moment. <clears throat> so I'm going to copy all these values here. And we're going to paste these into an Excel spreadsheet. sort this, organize this so it looks nice. Very good. So now we have our correlation coefficients easily reported. We probably might need to come back in here. Now we have values. We want to add some asterisks or stars. I won't worry about that for now. We're going to insert two columns because Although we want the correlations reported, something that people usually also want to see are the mean values and the standard deviation of the original summary variable. And we have that given to us as well right here. So we can grab those values. I should be able to paste those in right there. Oops. Looks like I pasted too much. So just a little, a little scrubbing here. stuff out. Okay. And probably shrink the number of decimals a little bit. I don't think taking it to the third or fourth decimal point is adding any uniquely valuable information. And at this point, it looks like we could do any additional window dressing, make it look nice, we could tweak it, format, change the font size. But I think at its core, this illustrates <clears throat> what we're looking for in when we're report, actually reporting a correlation matrix. Uh, and, that, and namely, that is, we'd like to see basic summary stats. And we'd like to see the strength of the linear relationship between the two and not get overly distracted with a bunch of other statistics. Uh, you could make an argument, maybe include the sample size or other things. But for now, I think this serves our purposes well and keeps our reader focusing on the most essential things we intended to show them in the correlation matrix.